Be sure to eat your lunch before you come. Because <laughs> it's not a luncheon. It's a tea. And we're, we serve more than tea. Cookie, <laughs> fruit, maybe a little salad. I don't know if we have this menu all worked out yet. But you know, we always are blessed. We always have such a good time. Yes. And we always have a few men that show up. Just like at the fish fry. <laughs> Inside joke. <laughs> okay, so mark your calendars. Be sure and get your tickets. Um, I'm not sure who has the tickets. The tickets are fifteen dollars. What a bargain! Amen. 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 Okay. Uh, do we have tickets printed up yet? Not yet. But you know what? We'll write your name down. And if you want to pay in advance, that'd be helpful. But um, if you pay at the door, it's going to be fifty dollars. <laughs> Just so you know. I mean, it's really good tea. You're right. Trader Joe's, I think. <laughs> oh, China! It comes all the way from China. Uh, some of it. So. As soon as we get the tickets, ladies, we'll let you know, okay? But uh, <coughs> mark it on your calendar. Start putting your $15 aside. It's going to be fabulous. What about the crafty? Amen. Amen. Back by popular demand. I've never had a place that had two crafties in one month. But you know what? It's amazing. It's an amazing event. It's $45. But I'm telling you, all the crab you can eat, all the tripod and, and pasta and salad, I'm telling you, it is worth every penny. And the fellowship. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there. How many of you are going to be there? Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Okay. Do I have more? The, the biblical dinner on the back of the candy. I didn't know it was that. Okay, biblical dinner. Okay. April the 24th at 7 p.m. Right here at Mer at uh, Victory Tap. Yeah. Is that where I'm at today? That's it. Victory Tap. <laughs> Have a little mental pause every now and then. <laughs> okay. So it's going to be right here. It's a biblical dinner. And uh, it, it's on the back. Did, did, did anybody have one of these? Or, or am I the only one? You guys got it in your bulletin? So on the front is the reminder about the tea. And on the back is the reminder about the biblical dinner. You can read all about it. We're going to have... Um, uh, Pastor Jay McCarl is finally coming to uh, Victory Tabernacle Worship Center, and he's going to have dinner that Pastor Hinkle has has ever experienced. Wow! It's very insightful. Very insightful. Whatever that is. <laughs> have you ever had an insightful dinner? Hello. Oh, yeah. Hello. 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 Have you ever had an insightful dinner? Yeah. I've never had an insightful dinner. I wonder what they say. Let's come and find out. Okay. God bless you. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you, Sister Julie. Oh, like uh, and uh, it states it's, it's a suggested donation of twenty five dollars, uh, but uh, we it's going to be in place of our Sunday morning church service, so we're not holding everybody to that. It's a suggestion, okay? So for our members, it's a suggestion, but there is a cost involved to bring it together, and it's well worth everything. I'm telling you, I waited twenty years for him to bring this here. I, I started asking him to put it on his calendar twenty years ago. 
I, every year I ask him to come. And this is the first time he had an opening. It's so popular. He's booked up always, especially in April, which is Passover season, you know. So uh, we are really, I'm really blessed. You won't want to miss it because uh, I don't know if he'll come back again for the next 20 years. But uh, yes, there, there we'll, we'll figure that out. Because of the fact that we're doing a donation, uh, we're doing a donation type of thing. But, so we haven't quite figured it out because I don't believe in charging for a church and we're not having church service that day. So it's just going to be a, a, in, the, in the evening, uh, we're going to have that instead. And we think we're going to need some volunteers to help set up. And so as it gets closer, we'll be asking the phone calls and asking for help. And so uh, I don't want the $25 suggested donation to keep anybody from coming, you know, that they can't afford that. I want you to come be part of it. Uh, but I want you to do your very best. Can we have an honor system that will do our very best? You know, because you know, sometimes when people get accustomed to doing everything, you know, no cost, they start expecting everything to do with no cost. And, uh, and, you know, I, you know, I do give him an honorarium and uh, we have to pay for the food and the setup and all of that. So, it would be nice. Yeah, she's got a good, uh, a good, uh, uh, suggestion. Yes. Yeah, those who can afford that. Yeah. If you can afford it. Yeah, that's always nice to sponsor something. I think that would be a buddy's A buddy's bunk. But it, it, it's, it's really a wonderful thing. Uh, also, you see the empty tomb. I'm an eyewitness, it's empty. You see Pastor Farm and myself and my cousin Nevada in there. We've been there. There's no body, there's no bones. There's, there's no linen, there's nothing. It's just an empty tomb. He's arose. He's risen. He's here. He's, he's alive. He's well. Hallelujah. Every other leader from any other religion is still in the grave, but Jesus is alive. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, we're gonna have a few of our prince songs, and then we're gonna we're gonna break and do a worship this time. And then the car shop will go back to worship. All right. So uh, we're getting on the same page. And uh, there's, please look on the back. There are some earnest prayer requests. One that's not on there is Brother Ed before. He was taken to the hospital this morning with some problem. problem. He's in the ER. Uh, Helen Berman is back in the hospital with her lungs are filled up with pneumonia, you know. And so, you know, be in prayer for all of these on the back. And uh, Sister uh, Juanita Scott passed away. She was in the board. That's on here. Her, her services are also going to be Saturday at 11. Is that correct? 11 o'clock right here. Come and support the family. There may be a lot of unsaved loved ones that could use the love of Christ right now. You know? So maybe they'll, maybe, uh, and, and the ones that are saved can use the love of Christ right now. You know? Because uh, we all need the Holy Spirit to comfort us during those times of loss. So, you know? But because of Jesus, we do have a hope. Because of Jesus, we do have an everlasting life. Because he is alive. How are you? Sister Marie, come and lead us in worship. Praise the Lord. This is a picture. We'd like to welcome you all in the house of the Lord. In Matthew 28, verse 6, it says, He is not here. He has risen. Amen. Amen. But if you're trying to find a reason why the Lord
9, 1 to 13. Spiritual fire. Whew, thought for the week. Then fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the portions of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Leviticus 9, 2 to 4. When we assemble together to worship, we should anticipate a close encounter with God. When Israel gathered for the first worship service in the tabernacle, fire blazed forth from God and consumed their offerings. Everyone fell on their faces before the glory of the Lord. When we gather in his house of worship on his appointed times, it is reasonable to expect that he will be present in some manner and impact our lives. On the other hand, the fire of the Lord did not blaze forth in that manner on a daily basis. The priests continued to serve and bring the offering every day. After that first miraculous worship service, they kept the divine fire alive by feeding the flames of the altar. But the amazing glory of the Lord did not blaze out again. There were probably some Israelites who felt as if something was amiss. Why had this tabernacle now become so spiritually dry? They might have wondered. Perhaps they were looking for other tabernacles where God's spirit was really moving. <laughs> people, some people are always looking for a spiritual fire. They are in constant pursuit of emotional high and pneumatic dazzlement. And they all are. Some people call it showmanship. <laughs> Charisma. They judge the quality of a worship service and the sincerity of other worshipers by means of their own internal emotional barometer. And they equate the mundane and routine with spiritual lifelessness. Other people are more like the priests. They may have had experiences with spiritual fire, but they do not live their lives in pursuit of experiences. Instead of demanding fresh fire from heaven every week, they are diligently keeping the spiritual flame alive as they go through the seemingly mundane routines of serving the Almighty according to his instructions. Sometimes there is fresh fire, but the mature man of faith serves steadfastly in all seasons. Which of the above two types of people would you prefer to be married to? Would you want the person who is always looking for romantic and physical thrills, even to the point of abandoning the relationship if he feels it's dried up? Or would you prefer the person who is willing to stay steadfastly committed in both good times and bad? Which kind of worshiper do you think God is seeking? The divine fire did appear again from time to time. At the announcement of the birth of Samson in Judges 13, when Solomon dedicated the first temple in 2 Chronicles 7, and when Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18. The divine fire signified that both the sacrifice and the sacrificer had found favor in God's eyes. In Acts 2, the flames of God's glory appeared among the believers, signifying the bestowal of the Holy Spirit upon them. It happened during the Feast of Pentecost while the people of Israel were worshiping at the temple and offering the prescribed festival sacrifices. We are still keeping that Pentecost afraid, alive today. The power of Pentecost. Thank you. Are you ready for the fire? Are you ready for the fire? Amen. We can't let it go out. We've got to fan the flames. And the Apostle Paul told Timothy to stir up the gifts that were placed in him by the laying on the hand. So you know that tells us that there are times that we've got to stir that flame up inside ourselves. You don't want to feel that God's right there with you. You've all read the footprints in the sand. But a lot of times, the very times that you feel he's abandoning you are the times that he's actually carrying you through. So I'm just here to encourage you today and let you know that there is a Savior. His name is Jesus. And he died for your sins and mine. And on that 
third pick and rose again from the dead, amen. Bringing us life everlasting and reconciliation to our Father. You know, Abraham was called a friend of God. In fact, they called the place that people waited until Christ's resurrection the bosom of Abraham. It was right next to hell. But we've been called not only friends, but daughters and sons. Ooh, what a great thing. So we can call him Abba. Do you know you can just cry out and say daddy? That's what Abba means. It means daddy. I want to do the Jerusalem and I see the little kids running through the street. That's what you hear him say, Abba, 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 Abba. Daddy, 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 daddy. We can call on daddy anytime. He's always there for us. And Holy Spirit is with us always. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's stare again as the worship team comes. And we're going to continue worshiping of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us stand to our feet. I will not tell you how to worship because it's something that comes within you. All I ask is to meditate on the Lord. Will you leave today without his blessings? I'm not just here for the reason. I came for him to bless you. So you're ready to have him bless you, worship him, give him all the glory, the honor, and the praise that he alone deserves, and watch and see him bless you today and forevermore. May God bless your worship in Jesus' name. Let us sing majesty and let us worship him.
to us if we are faithful to him. You know, our faithfulness in giving, we, we give voluntarily, but the bills come involuntarily. Whether we like it or not. I'd like them to go away. But unfortunately, they keep coming. You might say, well, I have extra expenses this month, so God's going to have to just wait. Like our taxes, you know, April 15th is coming up soon. So I think I'll give less this month. That's when God tests your faith. So, you know, you may think what you give may be a little, but to God, it's a lot. If you give what the Lord has called you to do, that's all that's required of you. We, we here at Victory Tabernacle believe that, that our 10% of what we make is God's. Because He gave you what you have, 100%. He could take what you have and just take it away. But because He has given it to you, we need to give back to Him. We pray that God is smiling upon you because you are in His presence because He has died on the cross and rose again. We are happy to be here this morning. I would like all of you to stand here at Victory Tabernacle. We don't pass the offering plate around. We just ask that you would just form a single file and just come around and, and put your blessings in the offering baskets. Lord, we just thank you, Father, for what your, your sacrifice for us, that you died on the cross for our sins, not for your sins, but for our sins, and that you rose again, and that we can serve you abundantly and mightily in our giving today. Lord, we just ask that you would bless us as we give. Bless us abundantly, Father. Meet every need in this house. Meet the church's need. Meet the pastor's needs. Meet every person in this house. Father, we thank you for your protection and your guidance. And we thank you for speaking to us this morning. And we just love you and mightily. We love you so much, Lord. To whom those are given much is required and we just thank you lord that you are faithful to us in jesus name in jesus name and everybody said amen
Mama. And uh, so those of us that are not in the presentation, we're going to go sit on the front row there. And uh, we will be back up here in just a moment.
The Lord loves the children. In fact, the little children were trying to go to see Jesus. And the disciples said, oh, shoo, shoo, shoo. The master's too busy. And Jesus said, wait, wait, wait. Hearken the little children to come to me. And unless you become like these little ones, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. What a blessing to have all the children in the house of the Lord. What a blessing to have the young sister that was ministering in worship dance. To raise up the children in the admonition of the Lord. There's no better thing. You know the word God tells us that if you train the child in the way that he or she should go, that when he is old, he will not depart from it. To your parents that have raised their children, to know the Lord, know that you have that promise that even if he's straight, they're going to come back. And I'm a little proof of that myself. I strayed, but I came back. So what better time than Resurrection Sunday, and what a better introduction than that, to ask Bernicia Nelson to come and to bring Jaden, Darren, Lee, Kirk. Darian. Jaden, Darian, Lee, Kirk. To come at this time.
that God knew Jaden, Barry, and Lee Kirk in your book. And it was there he called her to be a prophet Amen. to the nations. The word God further says that in the last days your children shall prophesy. Amen. And they will also see visions and dream dreams. Amen. As they get away. This young man has a purpose. Amen. The certificate I'm going to give you today at least. Certificate of Dedication. And it has the verse from 1 Samuel. Then it says, The congregation of Victory Tabernacle pledged him to stand with Venetia Nelson to raise his child, Jaden Darian Lee Kirk, born on the 6th day of March 2016, in the admonition of the Lord and dedicate him to the Lord this 27th day of March, 2016, giving him into the care and the will of God through Christ Jesus, and pray that he be empowered by the Holy Spirit all of the days of his life. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be upon him always. You see, it takes in the family of God to raise a child. Amen. For these are going to be times when you're going to have a little bit of a need of help. And especially if uh, God calls you to raise them alone, which I know is not your choice. But if that is what God calls you to, do, you need to know two things. Oh, yeah. God is never going to leave you, nor forsake you. Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Yes, and the Holy Spirit is going to dwell in you. And then, lastly, he has given you, us, the body. Amen. And I charge everyone in the body of Christ to stand with this family Amen. as they Amen. bring this child up in the admonition yes. of the Lord. Amen. We're, gonna, we're going to anoint him a little. Watt, can you come now? My hands are a little full. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to anoint him, and as you do, I'll decree in the name of the Father, and the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jaden, we anoint you this day and dedicate you unto the Lord in the name of the Father, the Son, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit. We pray that he will be with you always and cover you take you and guide you and strengthen you, that he'll keep you from all evil, that you will receive him and understand his ways at a tender young age, yes, that you'll be spared iniquity in your life, Hallelujah. that you'll be a man like Job, that when you open your mouth, yes, people will fall silent to listen to your wisdom, Hallelujah. because the wisdom of this child will be the wisdom of God coming from the Holy Spirit. I thank you, Father, Lord, for blessing this child. I thank you, Lord, for staying close to him. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for lighting upon him until that day that you fill him and he's baptized by Jesus with fire Hallelujah. and the Holy Ghost. Yes, Lord. I declare and decree righteousness will dwell in thee. Hallelujah. I declare and decree that you will be taught the ways of the Lord. You will be trained up in the yes, ways of the Lord. Yes, Lord. And that this church, this body, is going to stand with your family, yes, with your mother. And we are going to do our best yes, to provide the training, the love, and the care that is needed by every member of the family of God. Amen. We God. dedicate you, Jaden, to the Lord. Lord, we dedicate this child, Jaden, to you. And we consecrate his life as set apart and holy. We ask that you would not only have let the seeds be planted on fallow ground, but that you would remind us to water them often. Yes, Lord Jesus. And that your Holy Spirit would bring forth the increase of salvation in his life. And that he will fulfill his destiny 
to be a prophet to the nation. We ask these things in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, risen from the grave at the right hand of the Father, returned for his glorious church, including you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all the saints of God said, Amen, Amen. amen. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand. But the Lord spoke to me last night and said, I want you to do this one a little bit different. Praise God. And I said, okay, Lord, your way. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Your way. Your will. His ways are higher than ours. Amen. Yeah. Yes, Hallelujah. I just received a praise report. A lot of you know, I, I joke around if you take out your phones and tweet my message. A lot of churches say, put your phones away, turn them off. <laughs> I say, why fight City Hall? I know you're going to have them out. And tweet or post or share or whatever the good things happening in the church. Take a scripture, take a verse, take a picture, and share it with the world to let them know that you serve the risen Savior. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I just received a praise report from my godson Caleb. His sister had gotten missing yesterday last night, and we found her. So uh, thank you. That's what you today. So uh, his, his older sister, she's in her 20s, but how many know I mean, it's kind of, uh, it's very concerning when young people disappear, you know? So, so we praise God for that in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, today is a special day, and we would like to celebrate the Lord's Supper. So I'm going to ask the attendant clergy to come. I'm going to ask uh, if we have any of our Musicians with us still. <clears throat> we have a long program. They have their service coming up and following us as well. So we honor our, our dual citizenship members, those that belong to both Victory and to Cornerstone Economic Victory and uh, for their service. But we don't know that they, they, they're here all day, a long time from Saturday, preparing for two services on Sunday, and then we stay through our, a lot of our service of theirs as well, so praise the Lord. Uh, it's our tradition to have you come and to receive the emblems, and then return to your seat, and we will all partake together as a body, just so you know. Now some churches, they come forward and they take it right at the altar. We come forward and we take the, the blood and the bread, and we return the body and the blood of Christ, the bread and the wine that symbolizes the body and blood of Christ. We take it and then we take it together. So as we sing, go ahead and stand and come. Come you just come up the side aisles and go back to the middle aisle is the easiest way. Thank you. Oh, 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 oh. 
You see, the early church, they had taken something that was holy, the Lord's Supper, and they made it common. And they started, we want to please you. We want to live righteous and holy before you. We want to be set apart. But you say that, that if it's sin, that if we do sin, it's not us that sins. It's sin that is within the flesh that sins. So Lord, help us to crucify the flesh daily, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to gain the victory over that sin so we don't have to walk in it, but we can be free from it. And forgiven by the blood of Jesus. Yes, Lord. Lord, forgive us for the things that we know we've done wrong. Yes. And forgive us for the things that you have not revealed to us as of yet. Yes, Lord Jesus. But that we are doing wrong. Yes. So show us the right way. Yes, Lord Jesus. Show us what you expect and how to live. My Lord, my Lord. Set us apart, Lord, for your special yes, purpose. Clean us, Lord, that we might be worthy. Yes, Lord. And thank you for your blood. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you for the sacrifice yes, Lord of your body. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name. Yes. And all the saints of God say. Amen. 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 And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He would have said the hamotzi or the Hebrew blessing over the bread. Guess what? Jesus was a Jew. He did all of the things that the Jewish people did. He followed all of the customs that he had been taught from his fatherhood. And he would have said, Adonai, Eloheim, Melech HaOlem, Havonti Lechem, Mir HaOret. Let's say the English together. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth the bread from the earth. Thus he prophesied of his own resurrection. So let us partake of the bread. The body of Christ. Free from all sin. Hallelujah. You see, there's healing when we partake of the bread. There's healing, so if you need a healing, just claim it today. Lord, heal the bodies of those that need the healing of Jesus' name. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is. The new cup in my hand. This do is often to drink it in remembrance of me. He would have said the blessing over the juice. I love, I love, I love how the Jewish people have been saying the blessing over the bread and the wine for centuries before, and they still say it today, and every time they do, they're actually proclaiming the Lord's death, resurrection, and his Res redemptive power. He was a broken power. I don't know him, but I call him Bray Pure Hagapen. Let's say the English together. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Who's the fruit of the vine? We are. How do we become the fruit of the vine? By being grafted in to the family of God through the blood of Jesus. Let's partake of the fruit of the vine. The blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 The word says they sing a hymn afterward. Let's sing a hymn. The blood of Jesus.
saints. Don't you know that we are saints? Hallelujah. You know, that's the last. We have done that. Your daughter here with us today. And that's the last thing your father shared with me when I met him. He was urgently wanting to talk to me before he went back to Mexico. And I thought, what is so important? I think he knew where he was going to his eternal home. And he said, remind the people. He showed me several places in the scripture. He said, remind the people of God. They are truly saints of God. They've been washed by the blood of Jesus. And they're no longer sorry old sinners. Just barely saved by grace. But they're victorious saints of the Most High God. So their sins have been separated from them as far as the east is separated from the west. And he remembers them no more. Every time I get up and I say, and all the saints said, Amen. Amen. I think of that precious visionary friend that I only knew a short space of time, Don Manning. So, part of his legacy. Amen. I mean, over your words that continue on and on and on and on. Amen. Yes, Lord. To speak life. Speak, speak life. Hallelujah. Well, we have some special music. And I have a short sermon. It's more of a dramatic uh, presentation. I think it takes about 18 minutes and 9 seconds if I go through it properly. And uh, we have some beautiful music from the Passion of the Christ. Not the movie, but the actual Passion that illustrates the death and resurrection of Christ. Um, I in your program, I am listening as unto sing via Dolorosa. I'm removing that from the program today. That was for my grandmother who's not with us. And so I'm going to remove it and save it for another time. And uh, we're going to move right on. And then we'll be dismissed to go and enjoy the day with our families and celebrate the glorious resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let me say this. Those of you that don't get to come very often, it sure is nice to see you here today. It's really nice to have you with us today. Some of you grew up in this church and, and you're not here as often as we would like. But we're so happy that you did come and you're able to come. God. And our new visitors that are here today are yes, Robert and Arthur. Did you get that right? And Arthur, amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And then we have and then some of the familiar faces that I don't get to see a whole lot of. So, uh, good to see you, good to see you, good to have you with us. Thanks, guys. Uh, good to see your smile, Becky. You feeling better? Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, the young, the young man is Scott's son. We got so yes, you see that as well. And then I love him because I have to have him all the time. Amen. Yeah. So, without any further ado, we're just going to go through the song uh, one after the other. Uh, and uh, Sister Barbara is going to introduce the movie song. Ray sat down to write this song titled On the Hill of Calvary. But a copyright was not placed on this song until 1974. Before I go any further, I know some of you won't remember this, but do any of you remember the Revival Time radio program broadcasted by the Assemblies of God? Well, Ray knew the director, Sile McClellan, and in fact, Ray had sung with him when he was the music director with Reverend Sam Ward in Bakersfield, California, where Ray is from and where the Revival Time radio program started in the, under the watchful eye of a friend, Sam, Reverend Sam Ward. In the meantime, Ray wrote the song he is singing today called On the Hill of Calvary. And On the Hill of Calvary, was, it was sent to the Revival Time. It was selected as a song for an up-and-coming broadcast on their worldwide radio program. 
But before it can be used, the music portion of Revival Time would soon broadcast its final pre-recorded -pro pre program and would be going off the air. So as they sent Ray's original copy back with a note of thanks telling, me, telling him that they were sorry for the closure of Revival Time and thanked him for sending them the new song, one that they could have used. Ray said, seems like the life of my story, the story of my life. And then again, Ray rewrote his song and placed a second copyright in 2012. This version has never been sung before. He had no one to help him with the accompaniment. Even the director of Revival Time program was unaware that Revival Time happening was going to be canceled. They told Ray they were so sorry that they had only had two pre-recorded radio programs left for the air. At present, Ray is re preparing to send his song, so pray for that, record sales companies, and we pray that they will make it part of their sales package, even though his song has a copyright on it, he is giving it free to the public. Because of the biblical message of this song, please pray for us that his song will be shared with millions around the world and that it will, it will be a blessing. Ray is not interested in making money on the song, but to bless others. And now Ray is going to sing on the hill of Calvary. I hope it's a blessing to you. Amen. Last night I had a computer that uh, failed on me and so we're having problems getting this thing started. Thank you. 
when they crucified my Lord. Were you there when they nailed him to the cross? Were you there? Were you there when they nailed him to the cross? Oh, 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 oh. sometimes it caused me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they pierced him in his side? Were you there? Were you there when they pierced him in the side? Were you there? Oh, 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 oh. sometimes it caused me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Oh, sometimes they call me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Oh, 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 oh. sometimes it caused me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when he risen? From the dead, were you there? Were you there when he risen from the dead? Were you there? Oh, 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 oh. sometimes it caused me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when he risen? From the grave, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it caused me to tremble. Tremble, tremble. Were you there? Were you there? Were you there? When they crucify, when they crucify, crucify my, 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 my,
where they get together and they say to one another, claiming to be atheists, Hallelujah. although the evidence is against our science, you must keep the faith. Yes. Because if you don't, those creationists are going to prove there is a God. Keep the faith yeah, yeah. of a false theory yeah. that's been disproved time and time again. Every single time there's a new discovery in the scientific world, in the archaeological world, it always proves that the word of God is true yes, beyond is. the shadow of a doubt. Yes. Every time. The more we study about the roots of the original text, the more we learn the authenticity of the Bible, that it was quite scientific. It was not a fable. In the book of Genesis, we are told that God took a rib from man yes. and created woman. Yes. Amen. Many people think that's a fable. But as we study a little bit deeper and we go to the word that means rib, it actually can also be translated as spiral. Yes. When the Bible was translated, they knew nothing of DNA. So they use the word rib instead of spiral because looking at the human body, they couldn't find any spirals, but they can find a curved rib. Yes. But now we know what God was actually saying was that he took the very DNA that he created in man and he spliced it out to create woman. Yes. Praise God, praise God. In the beginning he created man. Man. And woman. He created them. Amen. See, he created both Adam and Eve. When he created Adam, for Eve was within him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now the science today and the translation of the scripture properly applied proves once again that the word of God is scientific, real, and true. It is not about the faith. Every single thing it has declared has come to pass, except for the happenings of the latter days. And they are beginning to <coughs> unfold before our eyes. Yes, amen. The word of God said he would rebuild Jerusalem. It would become a nation in one day. On May 14th, 1948, many who are still alive today witnessed the very thing with their very own eyes as Israel became a nation Praise in God. one day. Nice. He said they, he would call them back from the north, from the south, from the east, from the west. Praise and God. that in the end time, not one would be left in the diaspora. Nice. Today he is fulfilling that word. The Jewish people are going back to Israel in droves as they prepare for the final chapter of this part of God's history. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The word of God is true. Yes, the word of God endures. Yes. The word of God proves science. Yes. The word of God proves the truth. And praise God. Ladies and gentlemen of the journey, today I want to come to you. This morning I want to distill the overwhelming data about the resurrection into some bite-sized chunks. And I want you to ask, and I want to ask you to serve on a journey. Imagine this auditorium or this sanctuary is a courtroom, and each of you are sitting in a jury box. All right now. In my opening argument, I want to help you get the whole story about what happened on that first Resurrection Sunday. With all the information available in the world today, I will show that most of it is irrelevant and not very useful. It is just data that doesn't matter. What does matter supremely is whether or not Jesus rose from the dead. 
Jesus staked his entire reputation on the resurrection. If it didn't happen, everything that Jesus said and did is open to question. My Lord Jesus. The issue before the court this morning is not that of a crime, but of a claim. A claim so spectacular and so crucial that it is either the cornerstone of Christianity or its fatal flaw. Members of the jury, the claim is that Jesus Christ rose bodily from the dead. Yeah. The resurrection is the supreme miracle of Christianity. Yes. It is the very heart of the faith. If it never happened, Christianity collapses into mythology. And billions of people have been deceived. If it did happen, it authenticates everything Jesus did and said. And believers have the guarantee of eternal life and forgiveness of sins. Let me say it as strongly as the Apostle Paul said it in 1 Corinthians 15, 17. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. The resurrection is either one of the most wicked, heartless, vicious hopes ever been. Or it is the most fantastic fact of history. Whoa. I will show you overwhelming proof. Yes, I said proof. That Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus Christ. Did exactly what he predicted he would do. That on the third day he rose from the dead. Yeah. Acts 1, 3 states that to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. All right, yeah. That's what I intend to do this morning. I am going to present three pieces of evidence that when taken together will provide convincing proof my that Lord, Jesus did in fact rise from the dead. Yes, yes. The first piece of evidence I want to bring before the court, Exhibit A, the empty tomb. The Bible teaches that after professional executioners right. crucified Christ, his corpse was placed in a solid rock tomb. After his body was covered with about a hundred pounds of spices, it was extensively wrapped in strips of linen cloth. A very large stone, estimated to weigh about two tons, was then rolled in front of the entrance of the tomb. Amen. See before your eyes the picture I saw out myself and I took when I went to Jerusalem. This is believed to be the very tomb where Christ himself had laid, was laid. The track in front of it is where the stone had been rolled away. The man standing there in the colorful shirt in the middle is Dr. Arnold Zeiderman, my very close friend. We went on a pilgrimage with Pastor Fonda in 2004, and we went to this tomb to see if it indeed was, as they said, empty. My Lord Jesus. <laughs> as you can see, his body is not there. we are there to witness firsthand. It's an empty tomb. Never has it been used, aside from the time that Christ was laid. In fact, it was designed to be the tomb for the family of Joseph, Joseph of Marathia. And they had halfway chiseled out the second place for the second family member. But since Christ had been laid there and rose from the dead, it was deemed too holy to ever be used again. The half carved out stone is there and you can see it with your own eyes. Yes. I did, you can, it's true. Oh, Just geez. like the Bible says. Right. He was laying in a tomb that had never been used. Praise God. Praise and to God. add to that, it has never been used since. Man. After this boulder was in place, a contingent of up to 16 Roman soldiers was assigned to secure the tomb. Some pictures you may have seen show one or two men standing around in miniskirts holding a spear in their hands. 
This simply is not the case. These men were human fighting machines. These gladiators were trained to protect the area around the tomb against an entire battalion. Matthew 27, 66 tells us that in addition to the Roman guard, they put a tamper-proof Roman seal on the stone. Anyone who happened to make it past the Roman soldiers would then have to break the seal, which would be taking their lives in their own hands, as it was illegal punishable by death no. to break the Roman seal. No, they would thus incur the wrath of Roman law. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. Yeah. In spite of all these precautions, the stone, the soldiers, the seal, the tomb was empty. That first resurrection Sunday morning, when the first people arrived to peer in, they saw only one thing, the blood stained buried across the Jesus right. had materialized right through them. Yeah. Oh, the empty tomb serves as exhibit A. It is a powerful testimony to the resurrection of Jesus. Critics down through the years have not been able to refute the empty tomb. Instead, they've come up with other possibilities. Maybe the disciples stole the body. But this seems far-fetched when you consider that this group of cowards would have had to overpower armed soldiers, roll away a two-ton boulder, dispose of the body, and then manufacture a myth about his resurrection. A myth that they gave the very lives for. That does not seem plausible. Another possibility would be that the religious leaders disposed of the body. But this has some serious flaws as well. Yeah. If they had removed the body, all they would have had to do is parade the remains through the streets of Jerusalem, oh. and they would have derailed Christianity from the very start. But they couldn't produce the body because the body was no longer there. Yeah. Jesus has been raised to life and death from the dead. Yeah. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Christianity rises or falls on the empty tomb. Yeah. It is the one silent and infallible witness. Critics cannot explain it. They cannot explain it away. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then where is the body? Leaders of every other religion died and they stayed dead. Their bones are decaying in the ground. That's not the case with Jesus. He claimed that he would rise from the dead on the third day, and that's exactly what he did. The empty tomb validates his claim. While this alone proves substantial evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, I will grant you that this fact was not convincing in itself to the original followers of Jesus. Even though Jesus had predicted that he would rise from the dead, it's obvious from their behavior that they were not expecting it. They needed right. more evidence, something that would remove all doubt from their minds. My Lord Jesus. Men and women of the jury, I'd now like to introduce into evidence Exhibit B, multiple witnesses. The early Christians did not believe Jesus had risen just because of the empty tomb. They believed because they saw him with their own eyes. When they talked to others about Jesus, they did not say, we found an empty tomb. Instead, they said, we saw Jesus alive. The most outstanding proof that Jesus rose from the dead is that more than 515 eyewitnesses saw him on 12 different occasions. Acts 1, 1 to 3 says that the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he had also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Forty days! Jesus was among them for forty days! Over 515 witnesses Validated. They had seen and heard him teach to them for over 40 days. And then a crowd stood and watched him float up into heaven. Jesus gave unquestionable proof that he was alive. After
after his resurrection, he made an appearance to a woman in the cemetery. Later that same day, he walked through closed doors and he talked with his frightened followers who were huddled in Jerusalem. In the evening, he walked side by side with two men as they made way, their way down the road. He appeared to the believers and the doubters to tough minded people and tender hearted souls. All right now. Several people saw him on more than one occasion, some alone and some with large groups, sometimes at night and sometimes during the day. The Apostle Paul, when writing a letter to a group of new Christians, laid it out in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 6. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, right. and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third yeah. day yeah. according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve, after that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. Well, Two eyewitnesses are generally accepted as an apple in any court of law today. There were literally hundreds of accounts from first-hand eyewitnesses that saw Jesus in the flesh and heard his teaching before he was witnessed ascending into heaven. You can find many of these accounts in the Bible, but you can also find them in other literature that has survived from the ancient times until today. It is proven over and over and over and over again. All right, yeah. Now imagine if there was one eyewitness who saw everything and testified that the story was true. Many would be inclined to believe the account, wouldn't they? How about if there were three eyewitnesses corroborating what happened? It would be even stronger if there were 12 people who were willing to testify. Praise God. The case would be even stronger if 100 people saw what happened. It would be all airtight and totally convincing if over 515 people right, were lined and saw everything unfold yeah. in front of their very eyes. I've never heard of a trial that had over 500 eyewitnesses. Have you? To put this in perspective, if we were to call each of them to the witness stand to be questioned and cross-examined for just 15 minutes each and we went around the clock with our break, it would take from breakfast on Monday until dinner on Friday to hear them all. After listening to nearly 129 straight hours of eyewitness testimonies, who could possibly walk away and convince? Friends, that's how strong the case is for the resurrection of Jesus. Over 500 different individuals were willing to testify that they had seen the resurrected Christ. When Christianity was launched on the scene, these eyewitnesses were still alive. And they could be questioned. In effect, the early church could say, if you don't believe us, you can ask those who saw him with their own eyes. Peter, who was one of those eyewitnesses, got up in one day and he preached his first sermon. After summarizing what the prophets wrote about Jesus and how Jesus lived, Peter laid out the details surrounding his death. A copy of his sermon notes has been preserved in the Bible. This is how he formulates his conclusion in Acts chapter 2, verse 32. God has raised this Jesus to life. And we are all witnesses of that fact. Praise God. It's interesting that Peter preaches this sermon right in the heart of Jerusalem. The very city where Jesus was crucified and buried. People knew the tomb was empty. And that Jesus had appeared to hundreds of people. It was verifiable to even the unbeliever. <laughs> If you look a little bit closer, the first mention of zombies is also found in that account. For the Bible says that when Christ rose from the dead, hundreds of bodies came up out of their graves and were walking through the streets of Jerusalem. You see, the resurrected power of the Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead had an aftershock and it brought with it a whole bunch of other dead bodies that walked through the streets and everybody saw them with their own eyes. Peter later wrote a letter that appears in the Bible. He wants his readers to know that he didn't make the resurrection up. He saw Jesus. He talked with him. 
and he even had a fish fry with him on the beach one day. Here's what he wrote in 2 Peter 1.16. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. I love that song we sing today, my dear friend. Dr. Jack Kiefer wrote that. Majesty. Worship his majesty. Unto Jesus be our glory, honor, and praise. Majesty. Kingdom of authority. Flow from his throne unto his own. His anthems raised. Those who met the Jesus have had their lives totally transformed. Their resurrection is validated by the changed lives of his followers. Yeah. Something happened to rightly reorient this original group of followers. After Jesus was put to death, the disciples scattered. The Bible tells us that they were gathered in a locked room on the top floor of a building. They were filled with fear. Their leaders had been executed. What would happen to them now? All right now. If you've ever been to Jerusalem and you go into the upper room where the Holy Spirit fell one day, you'd find out something else that showed how afraid they were. That upper room was specifically chosen because it was over the tomb of David. And the Jewish people would not desecrate the tomb of David or anything in its vicinity by killing people in it, by it, around it, under it, over it, through it. They revered King David and they were superstitious people. And so the followers of Christ gathered in the room of yeah. the tomb of David the king because they were feared they were going to be put to death. And if they could just stay in that room, they were safe. John 20, 19 and 20 lets us in on a scene that would forever change their outlook and their lives. Then the same day of evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, when the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. All right, all right. Instead of confronting the disciples for not standing with him in his time of need, Jesus appeared to them and said, Peace be with you. Yeah. This overwhelming peace cut through their own guilt and their feelings of failure. Their fear was replaced with joy. Peter was chained to a coward who had denied Christ three times to a man of rock who became, became one of the pillars of the new church. These ordinary men were transformed from frightened wimps into one of the most effective missionary organizations the world has ever seen. Let me ask you a question. What motivated them to go everywhere and proclaim the message of the risen Christ? Was it for money? No! Power? No! Fame? No! Every one of them have come from doubt to determination, from confusion to conviction, from fear to faith. Listen, how they died. And if it seems, it sounds like they were just making up the story of the resurrection to you. Matthew was killed in Ethiopia. Mark was dragged through the streets until death. Peter was crucified and upside down at that. Simeon was crucified. Andrew was crucified. Philip was crucified. James was beheaded. Bartholomew was flayed alive. Thomas was pierced with lances. James the Less was thrown from the temple and then stoned to death. Jude, the brother of Jesus, was shot to death with an arrow. Paul was boiled in hot oil and later beheaded. All right. Members of the church. May I suggest that the only thing that could have possibly changed their lives so dramatically was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every one of these guys could have lived. Did you hear me? Every one of these guys could have lived. I'm going to say that one more time. Every one of these guys 
could have lived if they had just said one statement, he is dead. But they refused because they knew he was alive. And they knew the resurrected life was better than the life here on earth. They knew that Jesus was alive and he had gone to his father and he promised to come in like winter and receive us unto himself. Yes, yes. Exhibit C is changed lives. And only did the resurrected Christ impact this group of individuals. His life-changing power has transformed people from the third decade of the first century down through today. The combined testimony of changed lives attributed to the risen Christ runs into the billions from every race and tribe and language and nationality in the world. Despite the various intellectual and social backgrounds, believers are united in their conviction that Jesus Christ is alive. Man, yes, he is. Jesus has changed my life. And from taking, talking to many of you, I know he has changed your lives too. His life-changing power is just as available to us today as it was to that group of frightened followers on that first Resurrection Sunday night. I would now like to make my closing argument. In considering the resurrection of Jesus Christ, thinking men and women will take the time to sort through all the available information and to study the evidence. First of all, how do you explain away the empty tomb? Second, how do you argue against multiple witnesses? Finally, how do you get away from the fact that the resurrected Christ changes lives? The evidence strong and compelling. In fact, many skeptics have approached the resurrection with the goal of disproving it. As they gathered all of the data, they discovered that the evidence demands a verdict. Members of the jury, what's your verdict on the resurrection? He's alive! He's alive. Though you might agree with the strong evidence for the resurrection, some of you are bored with it. It doesn't do much for you. The data, simply put, does not seem relevant to your life. I'd be the first to admit that I am an info junkie. Some news makes me snooze. I'm like a lot of you. I want some news that I can use. Praise God, praise Before you just file this service away to get lost in the never-ending avalanche of bits and bytes of data, I want you to close my case by arguing that the resurrection is full of news that you can use. It applies in a remarkable way to your life. And let me tell you why. The relevance to you is found in the most quoted verse of all time. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. In Romans 10 and 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Hallelujah. And that worth the price of admission. Amen. Let us stand today and proclaim our verdict and say, He's alive! He's alive! He's alive! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus! Thank you, Jesus! You're alive! Thank you, Lord! You're alive! Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus! Thank you, Jesus! Lord, you're alive! Oh, you love us so much! Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together. Yes, thank you for this service today. <coughs> thank you for the evidence you put before this court. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we can rest assured in our salvation knowing that this same Jesus, yes, <laughs> this same Jesus, we oh, rose yes. from the dead, is coming today in the clouds. He's going to receive us unto yourself. Yes, Lord. Thank you. Thank you that that trumpet is going to sound. 
Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Lord. Lord, we're going to read one about to you today. Yes, Lord. And we're going to say this together, some out loud, some of our hearts. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for your son, Jesus. I confess with my mouth that he is the Lord Jesus. He is your son. He is the chosen one. He is the, one. He is the Messiah. He is the, he is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. I believe you are risen from the dead. And is right now at the right hand of the Father. Thank you for the sacrifice. Thank you for the sacrifice. That his blood paid for my sin. And the blood paid for my sins. Cleanse me, Lord, today. Cleanse me, Lord, today. Separate my sins. Separate my sins. As far as the east is from the west. Let it be separated from me. Let it be separated from me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. <coughs> that I might walk righteously before you. And give me the discipline to stay in your word. That I might be renewed daily. And I can crucify my flesh. And I'll be risen anew. With Christ Jesus. I'll be born again. Born into the spirit. Not into the flesh. I thank you in your name Jesus. And all the saints of God said, Amen, Amen. amen. Behold, a man of love, the Father has given up to us. Behold, a man of love, the Father has given up to us. That we should call the sons of God. That we should call the sons of God. And we are the 